grass, the white soldiers pass, the light is braying like an arse. See, the hard and braying light is zebra black and white, it will take away the slight and free. Where stalks in cap and guard, you swing and brag, and don't you sword of a patch you he is green as a cassada, and his hair is an armada, to the Jacob kiss me harder, he called across the back. Heard our voices thin and shrill as the steely grasses thrill over the sun of the unique when the folk has the picker in the palace of the queen I need. John Piper was born in Epsom, Surrey in 1903 and, as a boy, loved nothing better than cycling around the Surrey countryside, observing, writing, sketching and photographing, creating his own personal travel guides. A brief, unsuccessful stint in his father Solicitor's office was followed by Richmond School of Art and the Royal College of Art, which he left when he married Eileen Holding, a fellow art student. In 1934, Piper met Mifanwi Evans, an art critic and librettist, who became his soulmate and second wife, and the renowned Fawley Bottom farmhouse near Henley-on-Thames became their base. The childhood love of travel, writing and architecture led to work for the Architectural Review, where he met John Betjeman, who was to become a lifelong friend and travelling companion. One of Betjeman's particular passions was 18th century topographical guidebooks, which were illustrated with aquatints. Enthralled, Piper booked himself a course of lessons at the Royal College of Art at the cost of 10 guineas, marking the start of a long journey, experimenting with and pushing the boundaries of printmaking techniques. In 1938, Piper visited Brighton. Inspired by the seaside, the architecture and ambiance, and his recent aquatint lessons, he illustrated and wrote his first book, Brighton Aquatints. Seaside nursery gaiety, the need for special seaside contrasts and differences. Brighton has these more than any other place. The, the great yellow and white facade of Brighton is ranged along the parade to face the incoming breakers. The piers, the bandstands and shelters, the Georgian and Victorian and Edwardian hotels and lodging houses all act up. The bow windows and porticos, all these keep up the seaside spirit. They make thousands of people remember Brighton and long to return to it. They are the proper background for popular English seaside life. The Regency architecture of Brighton is worth fighting for, not only because it's good Regency, but still more because it's good seaside. One of the earliest of Piper's forays into printmaking was the production of the 12 Brighton Aquatints. They were published as a collection in album form in 1939, just, just before the war and they showed views of Brighton and Kemp Town and elsewhere. An interesting thing about the Brighton Aquatint is of all Piper's work, I think this was the first which had original prints by Piper sold as a collection. At this time, Piper was attempting to adapt abstract art and the discoveries of Cubism into his own language a riddle he tried to solve during the next 20 years. John was also a pioneer, really, with John Betjeman again, and one or two others, in the serious appreciation of the Regency. And it was clearly Regency Brighton. It was the Brighton of the Prince Regent, and of course, perhaps first and foremost, the Royal Pavilion, um, which attracted him to that. He made Regency Brighton accessible again. One of the Brighton aquatints of the whole 50 that were coloured, Betjeman 
had a go at watercolouring them. Those prints are particularly sought after these days for obvious reasons. Were they any good? They were all right for Benjamin. <laughs> These were light, decorative experiments in a way, but it was a small edition, it was well reviewed, and it took off. One such review was by Osbert Sitwell. His drawings are sensitive in an unusual way and manifest all the quality, the ease and speed of beautiful handwriting. He shows especially a rare aptitude for the rendering of architectural surfaces and manages to convey atmosphere with the strictest economy of means, though not of art. My uncle Osbert, at the beginning, or just before the beginning of the Second World War, received an invitation to go and see an, um, an exhibition of paintings and drawings by young artists. And John Piper was born in 1903, was still a young man in 1939. And so Uncle Osbert trooped along, and he saw uh, his, uh, Piper's work, was rather intrigued by it, and he bought this drawing, which is upstairs, of um, a Brighton Square. And um, then the war came, and Piper was made an official war artist. And my uncle was then writing his, his memoirs. And these smaller pictures here, he actually commissioned Piper to do to illustrate Left Hand, Right Hand, his five volume um, book of memoirs. And said to him, Look, if you're ever in my neck of the woods, do look me up. Which resulted in all these paintings by John Piper. It's not widely known that, I, that Osbert Sitwell and John Piper got on extremely well, and it was a very affectionate relationship um, with gifts and presents going to and fro. And Piper absolutely loved his visits to Renishaw. And he said that you know, because he never went to university, the kind of conversations that he listened to and took part in there were really a major part of his education. And it, it was often extremely funny with um, the stories that Osbert told about his father and Edith's contributions and so on. The curtain Piper designed for the entertainment facade by Edith Sitwell, described by her brother Osbert as an abstract method of presenting poetry to an audience. But all they saw was the curtain, an empty stage. Sun, a, a fireball in the fog, and Renishaw rising from ground mist, only top stories visible. Blue trees round Orange Folly Temple, a grey scabrous wreathing on the lake. Stationary swans, burnt out grass, colourless. Well, I always say there's uh, Diana and Neptune, who's risen from his watery kingdom and is drying his backside with a stone bath towel. He was particularly fond of the Sitwell's house at Renishaw, partly because it's both close to Sheffield. This was before the Clean Air Act, so all the industrial soot, you know, caked the building. And it was also very near collieries, and so, you know, the coal dust lay on the artificial lake. And he didn't sort of abhor that aspect of it. He saw it as all part of its history and part of its character. And I think that's partly why at Renishaw he used a black underpaint and then he'd take hold of his brush and using the wrong end of the brush he would score through the top layer of more colourful paint so that the black breaks through with sombre effect. And also it conveys the sense of age and weathering and, you know, grime. He liked the fact that a building moves through time. He did not paint buildings, country houses, as if, as if they were timeless curiosities. He liked to show how they had been weathered and aged and undergone a degree of decay. We were tweeted to every form of tenebrific effect of celestial limelight with, as it were, cloud slides. I think it must have been extraordinary in the war years to find 
yourself in this house with the huge mahogany doors and one room after another and wonderful Brussels tapestries and so on, where everybody else was experiencing food shortages and rationing and uh, wartime conditions. The war was upon us. Piper was due to join the RAF, but was plucked from the armed services by Sir Kenneth Clark, who gained him the commission to produce a series of paintings of Windsor Castle. It was during this period he developed a rapid and highly personal notation for topography. There was this feeling that something English was being lost. Well, that was a feeling intensified by the beginning of the Second World War, where it, where it might have been lost for reasons of cultural shifts. Now it's going to be bombed out of existence. So the drama in these uh, paintings, um, on the one hand, is it clearly goes back to many of the Romantic artists who liked dramatic skies and souped up, as it were, dramatic skies as part of their art. And he intensified that in his own paintings. But there's this elegiac mood I mean, they really are elegies for an England about to be lost, partly. And it's easy, perhaps, to forget the feeling of loss or potential loss that they were exemplifying at that time. He showed the pictures to George VI, and he looked to them, and the, the king was supposed to have said, oh, you didn't have very good luck with the weather. <laughs> but that was because John liked putting in all these... I mean, even if it was a nice day, he'd put it there. Sort of thunder clouds in the, in the sky. Kenneth Clark also managed to get Piper a position in his war artists scheme, recording bomb damage. Coventry was bombed on the 14th of November, 1940. He was phoned up, I think, by Kenneth Clark, and he went the morning after. And their fires were still being put out. They were still putting bodies out of the rubble. There was smoke and you know, it's a terrible scene. And he was very nervous about pulling out a sketchbook or a camera and being seen to take advantage of other people's misfortunes. It wasn't an easy task, but I think the real agony of it for him was the architectural destruction. This is not to say that he wasn't intensely moved by what people were going through, but he saw his job to portray the architectural tragedy. The, the ruined cathedral, a, a grey mealy-coloured stack in the foggy close, redder as one came nearer, and still hot and wet from fire and water, finally presenting itself as a series of gaunt red-grey facades stretching eastward from the dusty but erect tower and spire. Outline of the walls against the steamy sky a series of ragged loops, windows empty but for oddly poised fragments of tracery, with, with spikes of blackened glass embedded in them. Walls flaked and pitted as if they'd been underwater for a hundred years. Seventeen years later, Piper returned to Coventry with an equally difficult task. But this time, it was all about resurrection, not destruction. Optimism, not pessimism. Basil Spence's cathedral was, in many ways, a very brilliant thing. It looked back to the arts and crafts and forward to the modern movement. It was a curious mixture of the two, a uh, compromise, if you like. And what John was faced with was an enormous nutmeg grater, 82 feet high by 50 foot uh, across. And um, he just didn't know what to do. He tried an elephant behind it. He tried 
a, a, a whale, nothing worked, it all got turned into squares. And then he tried faces, and 150 faces in that window it would have been absolutely frightful. And uh, at that time, I had been sent a book by my mother on Bernini. Curious, isn't it? And um, I said to John, oh, well, you've got a trouble here, rather like Bernini did with the end of St. Peter's. And all you can do is to throw a bomb in the middle of it, and so that it bursts with colour and unity. And it's very appropriate, considering that Coventry was bombed. So if you throw a bomb in the middle of it, and I put it up high, but John said, no, you've got the right idea, but it's the wrong place. I'm going to bring the center of it right down into the center. And thank you, that's, that's the thing I'm going to do, yes. And this is what he did. John gave the top, which is entirely blue, a great super simple wash from right to left of a sort of light blue, slightly green. And I thought, oh, but if I double plate all the glass there, I'll uh, have just the right unitive effect in the blue. Because if I do that blue-green right the way through and then put different blues on top of that blue-green, there will be a harmonic running right the way through the glass. And as luck would have it, I went into my glass merchant in London, and um, there upstairs, wanting to be used, were crates and crates and crates of machine-made glass that were going to be put into green stop-and-go lamps, you know, for, for vehicles. And uh, they made too much, and they didn't know what to do with it. So I got it all cheap as cheap, and I plated the whole of that window with that green glass, and nobody knew it at all. Well, of course, technically, of course, I did. And uh, that gave a complete unitive thing in all the blues that were used, which were John Piper's blues. And that's what makes the top of that window so beautiful. I did every single piece of painting on the glass using different brushes, sometimes sticks or that sort of thing, to get the effect that John wanted. And every single piece of that glass was by me and no one else. And the design around the edges? They were very important, really. They are a variation on the idea of a medieval border, because when you have something in an architectural situation of very large pieces of colour, then how do you end it either side? You end it by a very small stutter of glass either side, so that the eye doesn't uh, uh, disappear off the window too quickly. It, it bumps into these little pieces of glass either side and gets steadied and then its attention is dropped. That is it. It's like a full stop at the end of a sentence. It's very much, except there must have been 2,000 full stops in that particular film, particular window. <laughs> so they decided to have a burst of colour in the middle, this great sunburst as it is. And of course it works. It meant that the picture had to be entirely abstract. And it came through on a wave of interest and abstraction. In 1956, an exhibition of American art came to London and the final room was full of abstract expressionists. And um, this gave a great uh, surge of interest once again in abstraction. So they caught the right moment with the right idea and did what I think is probably the finest stained glass window in England. <laughs>
But Coventry wasn't the first stained glass window Piper designed. That accolade goes to Andal School. Rentians had very successfully repaired a small window in Wantage Church for John Betjeman. John Betjeman said, well, I've got a friend called John Piper. Have you heard of him? And it was 1951, where anybody who hadn't heard of him was a complete fool. So I went to see John Piper, and I saw these amazing cartoons. They weren't fully done by that time. I saw the heads. And he gave me two heads and said, would you like to put these into glass? So I said, yes, I, I certainly will. And went back to the studio under Eddie Nutchins, whom I was working for at that time, near High Wycombe. And that was about 20 miles, I suppose, from Henley, where John Piper was. I only had a Vespa, and I made these heads in glass and had to put them between my knees, held close together, and drove a Vespa over the hills from uh, High Wycombe to John Piper's place. And they arrived perfectly in one piece, and um, he loved them. He thought they were absolutely excellent. And so that is really how I began with Aundel. The figures show the forms of Christ in nine different ways. Each of the figures is crowned with a golden crown, and the figures have drawn their inspiration from the works of Picasso and from the statues which adorn the portals of Bourges Cathedral and Chartres in France. Behind me, you will see the way, the truth, and the life. And Arundel was extraordinary, really. It was quite original at the time. It looks as though Picasso has visited the angels of Bourges, and they both got on very well together. And uh, that was a fairly accurate description of what it was, but the colouring was beautiful. Above the figure, the central figure of Christ, is the tracery that leads up to the top of the window. And in that, you will see a jumbled thorn bush. And the central figure of each of the Piper lights is a green man, or foliate head. And the tendrils lead up from the figure to the crown of thorns and to the thorn bush as the symbol of the passion. An empty stage. We've had busy Brighton seaside streets, devoid of people. Renishaw, Windsor, and bombed out Coventry, peopleless. And here, finally, we have figures, but they're statues, emotionless. I think that is a sort of thing that his inspiration, of course, coming from many a green man and mask on a church roof or church carving. In this, Piper was greatly influenced by a book on double-headed roof bosses in cathedrals by Charles Cave. I think there is this idea that they are not portraying human emotion. These windows here are particularly transcendent. These faces, you are not going to stare them down. They are looking at you. Now, I think in many ways I'd call them icons. They're an extraordinary subtle combination of a medieval feeling for a window and the substance of modern art. And, and this is something that nobody has ever done before or since. And this is quite unique to John Piper's work, I think. John had an absolutely phenomenal knowledge, I think, of English landscape. And not just the buildings and the villages and everything, but the people who lived there and the history and everything. As far as I could see, he was a kind of walking encyclopedia, but he wasn't at all scholarly. I don't think he was academically minded. And it was all based on personal exploration of, of England particularly, which he'd been doing uh, since he was a boy, uh, well, bicycling around England, making drawings and keeping notes. 
And that was what he had in common. Betjeman had the same knowledge, of course. So that when the two of them went out together, I mean, they had a phenomenal knowledge between them. The shell guides were Betjeman's creation. And they were a typical Betjeman creation in that they appeared to be slightly flippant and satirical. And yet, as well as being that, they were incredibly well informed and scholarly too. And that annoyed uh, quite a lot of people, I think. But John had a great uh, rapport with Betjeman. He was Betjeman like, I think, in, the, in that he was a very humorous person. One critic referred to Piper and Betjeman as a waspish pair, consisting of a writer of funny verses and odds and ends, and an austere, would be latter day Cotman. The Shropshire Shell Guide, written in 1939, was the first guide the odd couple worked on together, church crawling, as Betjeman termed it, and visiting such places as Ironbridge. In this late 50s work, the colours form into semi abstract rectangular patterns, probably influenced by his work on the baptism window at Coventry. A later lithograph is even more abstract. What excited him was that business of learning how to put one colour down next to another and seeing what happened. And it, it must have been a tremendous training of the eye and the sensibility. And it possibly helped make him that, so, as fluent as he was later on, that he was by then so aware of what colours worked next to each other and uh, you know, how, how to make them travel across the uh, canvas or the board. Both a far cry from the romantic art he admired, and it seems a shame he didn't actually attempt the bridge itself. Nearby Coldport was probably also part of the itinerary. The basic and unexplainable thing about my paintings is the feeling for places, not for travel, but just for going somewhere, anywhere really, and trying to see what hasn't been seen before. The Shell Guides brought together so many aspects of Piper, his topographical and architectural knowledge, his painting and sketching, book illustration, writing, interest in typography and photography. He learnt a lot about using the camera from Paul Nash. You use a red filter and double the exposure reading. That was the great tip from Paul Nash. Well, what a red filter would do, of course, is darken the sky. So that's that drama again, which, would, which John used in his photography, just as he did in the early neo-romantic period, if you like, paintings, the ones with the lowering skies. But John was like Paul Nash in the sense that he took up the camera, as so many people did then. And, you know, he was technically competent enough. He was never like a hard-bitten professional photographer. He was never going to be. It wasn't his sensibility. He had the eye. I mean, and, and that's what's much more important. Seeing something beyond what's superficially in front of one. I started with a number two brownie, but when I was about 18, I bought, in Brighton, a second-hand camera, which I stuck to, with modifications and, and a certain amount of rebuilding, till I was 60. My Brighton buy was called Ideal, the name indented into its black leather. It was a two and a quarter by three and a quarter inches affair, with a Zeiss lens and a rising front, which worked easily for horizontal and vertical exposures. He was a black and white photographer. I spent a lot of time later on with John trying to keep the shell guides going. This was after Betjeman had given up. And he and Edward, his son, who was also a very, very good photographer, um, were involved uh, bringing out the latest shell guides. But of course, there was a great opposition from the people we talked to about having black and white photographs. <laughs> um, and John and Edward particularly, they liked black and white, and they liked these, they liked these pictures of stormy clouds. The publishers wanted beautiful colour photographs with a bright, shiny, shiny summer's day. And <laughs> John and Edward <laughs> liked these, these uh, stormy clouds. There was a great um, opposition to to the black and white photographs, and he wasn't going to compromise on that. He stayed with the Shell Guides until 1984 when they clo you know, closed down. 
Um, and he said then that he felt as if he'd lost a limb. They were a crucial vehicle for enabling him to um, convey the sort of texture and structure and accretive traditions within the English landscape and architecture. After Betjeman's death in 1984, Piper designed a memorial stained glass window, which is in All Saints Church, Farnborough. It was made by Joseph Natyans and contains the symbols of the resurrection, the tree of life, fishes and butterflies. In 1939, Piper and another travelling companion, this time the poet and critic Geoffrey Grigson, visited Gordale Scar in Yorkshire, a limestone gorge much loved by the romantic painters and poets. The landscape was described as sublime, evoking intense emotions and inspiring awe through its vastness. Thomas Gray, for example, stated that he could not bear to stay there for longer than a quarter of an hour, and even then not without shuddering. The gorge was considered unpaintable, that is, until James Ward came along and painted this huge work. Piper himself discovered in the Tate that extraordinary painting by James Ward called Gordale's Scar, which was then regarded as a bit of an eccentricity, you know, and something that people sort of looked at but didn't take very seriously. And it was only perhaps later through the uh, Piper's rediscovery of uh, a romantic style that people were able to look back and see what a magnificent painting it is. One important influence on Piper was Turner, without any doubt. And uh, he, he discovered Turner as a young boy because the Tate opened whole roomfuls of the Turner bequest. I think when Piper was very young and, and his mother had this habit of dropping him into the Tate Gallery when she went shopping at the Army and Navy stores or wherever because she thought it was a safe place and it was also very convenient because his father who worked nearby could pick him up and he was just left to wander around on his own at a terribly young age and he discovered the Turners then and there and he must have expressed his fondness of them because his father once after he'd been very brave at a dentist I think it was gave him a pack of Turner postcards. I think you look at Turner, you look at Piper, and the sense of place comes over very strongly. The romanticism, that sense of this is unique in time and place, I think is very valuable. Piper was attempting to combine a sense of place and quality with his earlier abstract experience. In the winter, when the, the tourists are not there, it's possible to see the place just as the early travellers and the later poets and painters saw it. So, Ward and Turner influenced Piper's work, and we've also got Fuseli, Cezanne, Picasso, Diaghilev, plus the writers and poets Coleridge and Gerald Manley Hopkins. Who else for this steamy mix? The influences on him, um, well, they're in the 1930s, especially as, as he moved towards a kind of figuration. Clearly Brock's in there, uh, Christopher Wood. And then, of course, the Romantic artists, and he was one of the pioneers of British neo-Romanticism. He did the famous book about them at the time, in, in the 1940s, in fact, which took you back to the roots of neo-Romanticism in the Romantic movement in England. Again, a rather broadly interpreted definition of that, too. But I think he brilliantly appropriated some of the things he got from that in his own painting. He did like uh, obscure artists. Um, well, well, another one is, is C. R. W. Nevinson, for example. He liked that um, man with having those initials, and, and Frank Brangwyn was another. His, his enthusiasms. He loved Cotman, and I, he loved especially his um, architectural drawings, the, the many, many drawings and prints that he made of ruined abbeys and churches in East Anglia. 
And uh, he realised that Cotman had been looking at those buildings at a particular moment before the Victorians began to restore and renovate and alter. So as he said, they were ripe with decay. And Piper loved this sense of the ruination being allowed to remain, being allowed to be part of the building's character. He brought into the 20th century many of the grander things that he admired in British art from the 18th and 19th centuries and allied them to many of the more up-to-date choppings and changes that we've seen right through, the right through the 20th century. I found I was English and Romantic, so I looked at Cotman, Turner, Blake, Palmer and painters in that tradition and tried to draw things that I seemed born to love. Clearly one key influence in terms of colour was Matisse. Perhaps eclecticism isn't the right word to use quite with John, but what I always admired about him, he doesn't have any chronological divisions which are artificial, and he's as liable to take inspiration from Matisse as he is a Romanist sculpture, say, and the distance between those two is not that great for him. I'm sure you're familiar with the rather wonderful drawings he made of stained glass very early on in his career, almost at the beginning, some of the earliest things we know, brilliantly done, and with a tremendous sense of their colour and their intensity of colour. On the whole, I learnt more about using colours doing this copy than I've ever learnt before or since. The work had a life and personality that's rare and fragile, beyond price for those that feel its presence. The jewel-like brilliance of Greatly's 13th century glass would prove to be a lasting inspiration. What happened with the great corona up top was very interesting because John didn't know what to do with the corona. And I said, I've got an idea which may be the right one. Uh, what's that? Well, I said, um, I've just been reading Dante and right at the end of the Paradiso, there is a description of the Holy Trinity uh, which Dante produces and it's three great eyes of different colours, each one winking at the other. And there was a silence. And after three or four minutes, John Piper said, it's a pity Dante didn't tell you what to do with the rest of the cathedral. A full-scale cartoon of the window was painted by the artists in Piper's studio, the ribs between the panels indicated by black lines. The glass in the corona had to be load-bearing. The solution was to use dalle de verre. A dalle is a paving stone in France, and they'd invented it to get rid of the idea of leadwork. And it was fixed into concrete, and you had the colour one next door to another, and you had this wonderful vibration of one colour to another. And it wasn't painted, and the shapes weren't very subtle. But the interval was good. That interval structure was da dum da dum da dum bom 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 ding bom bom was very very important. And maybe we wouldn't have been successful in it in the same way had we not done a lot of ordinary stained glass first. It's not for nothing that John had designed for the theatre. And Liverpool, in a sense, the bottom part of it anyway, was a theatrical pulsation, giving you a certain emotional stance. And you had to keep your emotions in that marvellous sort of way. Yes, it was contemplative, if you like, but it was, don't think you're important. It's the whole atmosphere of the thing which is important. It is really a composite theatre decor. But a religious theatre decor, why not?
This is one of a whole series which formed the retrospect of churches and he intended to actually explore qualities of lithography as much as possible because this subject of churches gave him that opportunity. And St Nicholas is a case where he actually began the idea by drawing on lithographic transfer paper which is an old traditional method of making an image onto specially coated paper yep. which is then brought into the studio and pressed down through a machine onto the stone surface. After drawing the body of the church in very dense black with so architecture... it's almost like a silhouette, isn't it's it? It's almost like a silhouette and architectural details to left and right. He then took a, a lithographic pen and ink and completed some calligraphic treatment of architecture on either side of the building, finally ending up in the sky with crayon, lithographic crayon touches which give you these gestural marks around the building. The red, which is very bright scarlet red, meant as a contrast, I think, to the dense black that you see in the foreground. And it sort of pulls it up, doesn't it? It makes Otherwise it quite it a dramatic been... treatment mm. of this church. It's actually quite a complicated process. It's sort of three it, or four the, different elements. That's right, and that was John's intention because he liked to experiment with all kinds of possibilities. The dramatic anthropocentric landscape of Wales attracted Piper. It accorded with the notion in romantic art that the landscape can be used as a focus for our own emotions. I felt then that I was seeing the mountains for the first time and, and seeing them as nobody has seen before. Each rock lying in the grass had a positive personality. For the first time I saw the bones and, and structure and the lie of mountains. They had a place in, in North Wales, in Snowdonia, and, and John did a lot of work at one stage in Snowdonia. But I think, as people who've been to North Wales say, it, it rains too much. So <laughs> they got fed up with that uh, eventually. The Milfoy action of ice and frost, some done up like portmanteau with incised lines in place of the straps, large areas of quartz veining and speckling, tumbled and angled in all directions. Topography at its best is the interpretation of the world as a vision of the place. The best topographical paintings have the spirit of the place in the time. We're in the Tate Library and Archive. We're looking through a sketchbook here where he's obviously abstracting particular landscapes. A quick sketch. Ah, and this, this one is actually of Carnarvon. And you can see he's got the street here. He's drawn in the shapes of the buildings, more or less. He's written down the colours he wants, like red brick, green, slate. And we've got a church tower in the background here. And then down below it, he's actually abstracted this into blocks of colour, divided by strong black diagonals and verticals, so the red brick there has translated into this large red lump here, which is obviously splattered with his, with his finger. And here again, green equates to the green there. Today, castles are either whiskered ruins or tidied up ruins. The latter are more frequent. Carnarvon is a magnificent ruin which has been tidied. A short drive from Carnarvon and Piper discovered a waterfall even more spectacular than Gordale Scar, Pistol Raider.
Romantic art is the result of a vision that can see in things something significant, beyond ordinary significance. Something that, that for a moment seems to contain the whole world. And when the moment is past, carries over some comment on life or experience besides the comment on appearances. We've got another sketchbook here. It's a Daler's sketchbook and he's written on the front, Mrs. Daler's Diary. And here we've got more abstract type works. They look as if they're sort of beach sketches. Lots of blues and reds, blacks. And these look rather like some of his Anglesey Beach pictures. For example, there's, there's this one of Anglesey Beach, which was a lithograph. And we've got the same sort of pebble shapes punctuated by the red and the blue blobs. Another one, the same sort of theme. You can see the speed with which he's worked at these, the, the watercolour in the background, and then a sort of two centimetre thick brush with big, bold black lines over it. And in fact, that's, that's probably even more similar, apart from the fact that the blue mark here is now red. It's very similar. And here he's just thrown the brush at it. You can see the sort of splash marks of the wetness on the brush. That's a black and white version of the same. Again, it shows enormous speed and spontaneity. Pure abstraction is undernourished. It, it should be allowed to feed on a bare beach with tins and broken bottles. Dispirited by the continual rainfall in Snowdonia, the Pipers turned their attention to South Wales, and in 1962, they acquired a small cottage in Pembrokeshire, which became the subject of numerous pictures. Piper also developed a fascination for non-conformist chapels. We're looking at a work now which is of a Swansea chapel and is dated 1966, so two, two and a half years after the previous one. And That's it's completely correct. different in looks, isn't it? Is, it is, yes. There is development taking place with the photographic interest that John always had in making prints. And what you've got here is a two-colour print, black with greys and blue in the background, uh, representing not a conventional sky, but one which he made, um, making a film positive, which you can see on close examination with right. uh, so the film that we've got. And what you see here is in fact a photographic negative blown up to the right size of the potential print and actually it's the sort of quality of texture that interested him at the time the drama of something almost lit with a very strong light from right to left here he's actually inserted a piece of photographic positive to give the architectural detail of the central window Yep. Now this is in a way is rather like drawing, but instead of using a pencil, you actually use collage pieces that are appropriate to your idea. Which goes back to his early years of using collage uh, and exactly, also photographs. Exactly that. But he's combining them two in a completely new way. Particularly in that way, yes. yes. So here we've got the lettering. Yes. It, it is actually letter set, isn't it? It's letter set, yeah. yes. It's wonderful. Needless but to say, Libby, we actually encourage him to pursue his experimentation as much as possible because this makes the work artist-led to a degree that you normally don't get when you have reproductions. Well, and I suppose the relationship between the two of you would mean that you were both continually finding new ways of doing exactly things. Exactly. To sparking off the imagination. Yes. And then this one's interesting. This is Piper's own marbled paper, is that right? Yes, John was very fond of marbling paper and he took to using his own bath at home in order to promote the way in which it's done, this <laughs> was by him. But my family was pleased. <laughs> absolutely. And he was fascinated by the interaction of water and 
ink repelling substances, volatile processes which would evaporate and just allow the pigment to float on the surface. It suggests clouds, but in fact is something entirely different, mm. but represents accurately his idea. So you get this juddling with typography, with the photographic textures of the facade of the building, and in the background you get the activity of this marbling. Do you think this willingness to experiment came from not having a complete artistic training, that it, it sort of gave him the space to experiment with technical I, advances? I, I would agree with you. So he was constantly reassessing his ideas as he was actually making the print and storing up information for future prints that would benefit from these situations. Yes. I don't know why we've come here. There's nothing to see. Aha, it was the romantic desolation of Portland which attracted Piper. A nondescript desert, bleak, massively overlooked, but magical. Great rectangular blocks with cutting marks in regular rows lie about everywhere, weathering in the rain and wind and odd, unrectangular but still angular blocks have been thrown aside. Blocks whose stratification has defeated the expert quarryman. In the quarries, yet more stone lies half-cut, surprised by the light, with the straight strata joints exposed as, as if it had all been cut and packed away and hidden there by men in the first place, and has been waiting all this time for other men to unpack and take it out again. He was fascinated by those slabs of stone, and he defines bits that are partly natural, natural formations, man-made formations, the sense of the past, present and future, the way that you get a sense of time shaping the landscape and so on. Abiding also in the romantic painting of this country is the sense of drama in atmosphere, in the weather and the seasons. As a race we have always been conscious of the soft atmosphere and the changeable climate of our sea-washed country, where the air is never quite free from mist where the light of the sun is often more pale and pearly than it is fiery. The church of St George Reform at Easton on the Isle of Portland was sketched from many angles. There's one very odd thing about painters who like drawing architecture. They hardly ever like drawing the architecture of their own time. I know perfectly well that I would rather paint a ruined abbey half covered with ivy and standing among long grass than I would paint it after it's been taken over by the Office of Works, when they've taken all the ivy off and mown all the grass with an atco. He also liked these flat places in Lincolnshire, and the Romney Marsh particularly, I think. He said to me it was 98% atmosphere, which <laughs> is very, perhaps quite hard to explain, unless you go there and you see what he means. A very flat landscape, but of course with these huge churches all over it. Each one is individual and different from the others. And that, of course, especially appealed to him. We're looking at the sketchbooks which Piper put together when he was writing the book about the Romney Marsh. He refers to the stock farmers on the marsh as the Romney Kings, which is why they had such large churches. Um, in a way, they were a self-aggrandisement. It showed their great wealth. And here he's got a couple of very quick sketches of Ruckin's church on which he's written orange tiles and with a dark, lowering sky as usual. The ballet-skirted spire with its lead pinnacle crowning it 
and, and the very wide roof covering the nave and south aisle give the exterior an attractive Kentish character. An irregular buttress structure in fields neighboured by a large dark yew which enhances the beauty of the warm yellows and browns of the lichen on the pale umber and silver stonework and shingled spire. The structure is largely of the 13th century. This is St Clement's, Old Romney, one of the many churches on Romney marshes which Piper loved and drew. And he did a fabulous watercolour of the interior, which I've been wanting to see for ages. So, shall we go and have a look inside? do his picture from. I suppose it's a wonderful chancel arch and just look at those squints. Aren't they so Good afternoon. Sir Donald, how Lippy, lovely to how see lovely to see you. you. And you. Well, well, well. Ah, so what are you doing here? Well, we're making a film about John Piper. Are you really? Who you probably know, uh, well, did I'm a book about... Just a minute, just a minute. Look at that. Oh, you've got a little copy here with me. Brilliant. Well, it was supposed to be a handbook, wasn't it? Yes, in I, yeah, indeed. No, you um, see, R R Piper, I mean, we, we, have, we owe a great deal of Piper here. Because I, I'm, I'm a vice president of the Romney Marsh Historic Churches Trust. Ah. And this is one of our churches. So I'm going around this morning having a look at most of them and see if all is well, you know? Yes. And, uh, but Piper, you, you know that he was one of the originators of this uh, trust? No, I uh, didn't. Uh, no, Piper. Tell me more. Uh, Archbishop Runcie, Archbishop of Canterbury at the time, and Richard Ingram. R Romney Marsh is bounded by the Royal Military Canal, which starts yes. at Highs and runs right round in a great arc round to Rye. And the churches within that arc are the Romney Marsh historic churches. Um, 11 of them. But sadly, you see, so many of them are, they're not redundant, but you know, the population is not what it was. Mm. The same with the Suffolk churches. Mm. that um, unfortunately the population has moved away and uh, leaving very few parishioners to look after these beautiful churches. Uh, the interior is, is one of the best and, and least spoiled Georgian interiors in the country, giving an excellent idea of what a village church was like 150 years ago. Most of the woodwork has been painted grey, which is effective. There's a classic reredos, and there are simple Chinese taste gates in the chancel arch. Yes, I don't know what the history of those is. The royal arms hang over the chancel arch and oval texts of the marsh type are hung on each side of them and over the arcades. But anyway, Libby, you, you've got one of these, haven't you? I have indeed, yes. yes. <laughs> Wonderful, <laughs> lovely. But can. lovely to see you. And you, oh, and you. Lovely to see you. Be good. What a chance. Yourself. <laughs> Try to. <laughs> Bye. Owing to the pitting and scoring of the stonework by weather, this church takes on the mood of the day in its appearance, looking dark on a grey day and pale and silvery on a clear one. The roofs are of pale grey lead. The church was built about 1730 and the tower added rather later. Nearby Dungeness delighted Piper as much as the Romney Marsh churches. This shows his interest not just in the churches and the countryside, but all aspects. It's all about shingle beaches and how they formed. And he's actually done a sketch to show himself how the shingle beach is formed. Ah, here we've got some more pictures of Dungeness. Brick blocks with white joints. That's what he's written about, that one. There's a sailing boat there, fishing boat, and rather higgledy-piggledy clouds. And here's another view of the same, with more fishing boats and the little black huts, and just dots and quick circles for the shingle. And more pictures of little black boxes and fishing boats. Although it's very basic, it does actually remind you how wasted the land is down there. The whole area looks like an oversized nursery floor. Very untidy at first sight, but having an underlying pattern that makes sense when it's worked out according to its proper scale and symbolism. 
The lighthouse, black and white striped with its white outbuildings with black chimneys as gay in its Trinity House manner as the shacks, dominates everything. The Romney Marsh book was a pocket-sized affair, and the Brighton Aquatints, a portfolio, unlike the Stowe book, produced 33 years later. Towards the end of Piper's life, he produced a much larger portfolio of pictures of Stowe. For much of his life, he'd been interested in Stowe. In fact, he used to rent rooms in one of the garden ornaments at Stowe and used to stay there for quite a long time doing drawings and sketches and so on. The interesting thing here is that this is a book of colour reproductions of some of Piper's liveliest drawings of this magnificent place. And this particular picture, the pebble alcove, is reproduced as a full page illustration in the stove, but whereas that is a reproduction, this is an original screen print. It's a flat surface and it's printed through silk screens. It's an interesting example of how he, Piper, had gone from quite a small portfolio at the start, a landscape book of a townscape subject and he came to this massive folio to record the grandeur of the 18th century that he so much admired. Landscape delight unique in England. There was much more untidiness, more dilapidation of buildings and more pleasing decay than I've ever seen there since. Piper thought that buildings were like people. They had, you know, personalities and characters, and that like people, they should be allowed to both live and die. And hence he coined the term pleasing decay, which was against the notion of too much tidying up and too fixed an approach to conservation, which um, fixes a building in a particular moment or, of time. He thought buildings should go on and decay. Pleasing decay has formed a part of the vocabulary of English romantic painting for 150 years. Those people who have no eye for it say that it indicates the decay of the mind to dwell on it. Those who have an eye for it say that a weathered building can symbolize the whole of man's relation to nature. Piper was not averse to working on a grand scale, as in his tapestry for Chichester Cathedral, commissioned by the Dean, Walter Hussey. Hussey often said that the uh, commission of the Piper tapestry was the one which caused most controversy, basically because you couldn't avoid seeing it. It came about in 1960s when Walter Hussey thought that the high altar was rather dark, with the Norman architecture and the 16th century screen on which the tapestry is now hung. And so he got in touch with Piper, his friend, and asked Piper to come to the cathedral to advise on what would be suitable to brighten up the high altar. When Piper came, he had a look at the Norman architecture and the screen, and he thought the most suitable medium would be tapestry. The Dean agreed that that would be the way to move and so uh, with other advice Piper came up with a design based on the dedication of the cathedral which is the Holy Trinity God the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit. 
The tapestry was made by the firm of Pinton Frere in Aubusson, France, a town famous for its tapestry weavers who had arrived there from Flanders in the late 16th century. In the 20th century, such luminaries as Cocteau, Calder, Dali, Braque and Picasso had been invited to work with the weavers. When Piper's tapestry was complete, it was laid out in the town square for all the craftspeople to admire their handiwork. I think it's no accident that he was rooted in uh, Surrey in many ways, a friend of Vaughan Williams and that sort of English spirituality that possibly sometimes comes over as Christianity of the small sea is part of Piper, but it's very deep, it's very devout, but it doesn't shout about itself a great deal. And I think in particular his use of colour is about celebration as much as anything and highly appropriate when you come into a church. Piper delivered us from seeing God and the saints in the church in such drab colours, frankly. <laughs> It has been suggested that Piper's abstracts take inspiration from the stage, and Rentians mentioned Piper's genius for theatrical decor. The concept of buildings being dramatically lit formed part of his visual makeup. Added to this, a love of music, and we have another of his great collaborations, this time with Benjamin Britten. I gather in other spheres of his activities, he was equally keen to cooperate with practitioners of all kinds and in the studio I found him to be a very uh, keen uh, exchanger of information and ideas about what he was hoping to produce. In other words, not unlike a theatrical production, he, John Piper, being the principal involved in the catalyst of life, but around him are all these other individuals who contribute to the final performance. So it was a teamwork, in a sense. Absolutely, and I think it led him into uh, the making of stained glass, the theatrical work that he was involved in, with great ease, because he knew people would react to his enthusiasm, and he would listen to them and be guided by them on certain issues, which would improve the idea that he was trying to put forward. He would be the leader. Britain and Piper worked together on a number of operas. Piper designing the scenery and costumes. The last opera Britain wrote was Death in Venice, libretto by Mifanui, scenery by Piper. Piper once said of Britain that there was a streak in his character of, you know, restrained, it was restrainedly violent or something, and that it rather endeared him to him. It seems to me that it's possibly also a characteristic in Piper himself. There is a great energy in Piper's work, isn't there? Not physical violence, but a sort of violence in the medium almost, I think. Piper designed a memorial window to Britain in St. Peter and St. Paul, Aldborough. The window was made by Patrick Rentians and depicts Britain's three church parables, the prodigal son, Curlew River, and the burning, fiery furnace. Piper is essentially an English artist. English in vision, English in subject matter, English in treatment. But he did love Venice. Why? I think Venice was the one place that he 
had a very close affinity for because of the excitement and the drama and the dramatic lighting. And of course, it enabled him to express his love of the decorative and the baroque and so on. We didn't have very much baroque and rococo stuff in this country compared with the richness of Venice. Piper brought back, in fact, his own stage sets, as it were, in his paintings. They're paintings and prints of Venice, but they are, in fact, his own interpretation. The overmantel at Renishaw is decorated with a mural of Venice. That's the old, old Dogana, the customs house, which is at the end of the Zattere in Venice. And this is the great church of Santa Maria della Salute. And I've never really learnt Italian, but Salute has a double meaning in Italian. It means both salvation and good health. And it was built by the survivors of the great plague when it hit Venice. Rather like how St. Paul's was um, rebuilt. And there is a line of St. Mark on his column. And then beyond that is a campanile. Ruskin is crucial to Piper. And of course, he knew the stones of Venice. Piper, I think, suggested to Adrian Stokes that they might do a book together, collecting together Adrian Stokes's writings on Venice and adding in Piper's illustrations. And he was certainly obsessed with it. Of course, as everybody knows, it's a wonderful experience with the architect reflected in the water the, and so on, and the sense of movement created by the water and the lights and reflections. So it was perfect Piper material. Venice is all about drama. It's a city in black and white. The black of the gondolas and gondoliers, the white of the bleached Istrian stone, and throw into this melee the sun flickering on the water, the floors and the windows, and the impermanence, the decay, the pleasing decay. And all this would have appealed to Piper in so many other ways, a quintessentially British artist. We're coming to the end of our drama with these magnificent full frontal architectural images but I'm still intrigued by the apparent contradiction between the artist, many of whose greatest creations were a result of collaboration, and the empty stage. Even in such a bustling city as Venice, there's still no humanity. One thing he, he felt was that people are only ever incidental in landscape. They pass through it, they're not part of it. They're transitory, and I think he was after something that is there today and in a hundred years time and so on it will be there. <laughs> <laughs>